All right, so quick reviews, Revelation general review. What is the book of Revelation about? It's about Jesus. <laughs> Where's Jesus? That's right. It's about the return of Jesus. And what do you got to keep the big picture in mind here? It's about the return of Jesus. Is everything literal? No, no it's not because it's apocalyptic, it's prophetic, there's a lot of symbolism, and it's epistles. And we are, therefore, we should not necessarily take everything chronologically, although sometimes it seems like things should be. We might run into some of that tonight. Um, and again, do we know everything? Clearly, we don't. And that wonderful quote from Paul Washer, when Jesus returns, you'll know everything you need to know about eschatology in about 10 seconds. Love that. So big pieces, Christ will return, Christ wins. Intro to this week. Specifically, when we last left our heroes, we had gone through the seven bowls of God's wrath, the final set of seven. We had seven seals, we had uh, seven trumpets, and we had seven bowls. And so the seventh bowl, remember it said, it is done. And again, three kind of shades, perspectives of the end of the world, the return of Christ and judgment on his enemies. Uh, Armageddon we saw last time being introduced or the day of the Lord and then that pretty much where we were was the completion of what uh, we think John saw, saw on the scroll so as the, as the seals were opened you know he saw those events those decrees of the Lord for the end of the age and the start of the new one and so that had completed what John saw on the scroll all right uh, I do have a movie for us, uh, once again, an edited movie. So this is, this is uh, I picked it up a little bit from the end of the bowls there and then into uh, where we are today. So this, this video is just about seven minutes that we'll take a look at, give us a good overview. All right? So theoretically, I push this button. Now that the choice is clear, John replays go. a final cycle up. of seven Don't divine panic, judgments. Don't panic, because you've heard this part Symbolized before. as pouring out seven bowls. Ready. Now we know from the Lamb's scroll and from the sign visions that many among the nations do repent. But as the Exodus plagues are repeated and poured out through the bowls, there are many people who do not repent. They resist and curse God just like Pharaoh. And so it all leads up to the sixth bowl. As the dragon and the beast, they gather the nations together to make war against God's people in a place called Armageddon. This refers to a plain in northern Israel where many battles were fought by Israel against invading nations. And some people think that this sixth bowl refers to an actual future battle. Other people think that it's a metaphor for God's final justice on evil. Either way, John's clearly taken images from the book of Ezekiel about God's battle with Gog, Gog was Ezekiel's symbol of the rebellious nations gathered before God to face his justice. And that's what comes in the seventh bowl. It's the fourth and final depiction of the day of the Lord when evil is defeated among the nations once and for all. Now, John has fully unpacked the message of the Lamb's unsealed scroll. And now he goes back to expand on three key themes that he's introduced earlier. The fall of Babylon, the final battle to defeat evil, and the arrival of the new Jerusalem. And each one of these explores the final coming of God's kingdom from a different angle. So first, the fall of Babylon. An angel shows John a stunning woman who's dressed like a queen, but she's drunk with the blood of the martyrs and of all innocent people. She's riding the dragon beast from the sign visions. It's a symbol of the rebellious nation. And she's called Babylon, the prostitute. Now, the detailed symbols of this vision, they would be very clear to John's first readers. He's personifying the military and economic power of the Roman Empire, but he's also doing more. In this vision, John has blended together words and images from every single Old Testament passage about the downfall of ancient Babylon, Tyre, and Edom. John showing how Rome is simply the newest version of the Old Testament archetype of humanity in rebellion against God. They come together and form nations that exalt their own economic and military security into a false God. This isn't something limited to the past or the future. It's a portrait of the human condition throughout history. And Babylon's will come and go leading up to the day when Jesus returns to replace Babylon with his kingdom. But how will Jesus' kingdom come? 
Up to this point, the day of the Lord has been depicted as a day of fire or earthquake or harvest. And now it's depicted as a final battle, and it's told twice. It results in the vindication of the martyrs. Now, John takes us back to the sixth bowl, where the nations were gathered together to oppose God. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. He's the great hero. He's the word of God riding on a white horse, and he's ready to conquer the world's evil. But pay attention. He's covered with blood before the battle even begins, and that's because it's his own. And his only weapon is the sword of his mouth. It's an image adapted from Isaiah. John's telling us that Armageddon will not be a bloodbath. Rather, the same Jesus who shed his own blood for his enemies now comes proclaiming justice. He will hold accountable those who refuse to repent of the ways that they participate in the ruin of God's good world. And the destructive hellfire that they've unleashed in God's world justly becomes their own God-appointed destiny. After this, John sees a vision of Jesus' followers who have been murdered by Babylon, and they're brought back to life, and they reign with the Messiah for 1,000 years. Then after this, the dragon who inspired humanity's rebellion against God rallies the nations of the world together to rebel against God's kingdom. But before God's throne of justice, they all face the consequences of eternal defeat. And so the forces of spiritual evil and everyone who doesn't want to participate in God's kingdom are destroyed. They're given what they want to exist by themselves and for themselves. And so the dragon and Babylon and all who choose them are eternally quarantined never again able to corrupt God's new creation. Now, there's a lot of debate about the relationship of the 1,000 years to these two battles. There are some who think it refers to a literal chronological sequence. Jesus' return, followed by a thousand-year kingdom on earth called the millennium, followed by God's final judgment. Other people think that the thousand years are a symbol of Jesus's and the martyrs' present victory over spiritual evil, and that the two battles depict Jesus's future return from two different angles. Whichever view you take, the main point is clear. When Jesus returns as king, he will deal with evil forever, and he'll vindicate those who have been faithful to him. The book concludes with a final vision of the marriage of heaven and earth. An angel shows John a stunning bride that symbolizes the new creation that has come forever to join God and his covenant people. God announces that he's come to live with humanity forever and that he's making all things new. John's vision here is a kaleidoscope of Old Testament promises. This place is a new heavens and earth, a restored creation that's healed of the pain and evil of human history. It's also a new garden of Eden, the paradise of eternal life with God. But it's not simply a return back to the garden. It's a step forward into a new Jerusalem, a great city where human cultures and all their diversity work together in peace and harmony before God. And in the most surprising twist of all, there's no temple building in the new creation because the presence of God and the Lamb that were once limited to the temple now permeate every square inch of the new world. And there's a new humanity there fulfilling the calling placed on them all the way back on page one of the Bible to rule as God's image, to partner together with God in taking this creation into new and uncharted territory. And so ends John's apocalypse and the epic storyline of the whole Bible. John did not write this book as a secret code for you to decipher the timetable of Jesus' return. It's a symbolic vision that brought hope and challenge to the seven first century churches and every generation of Christians since. It reveals history's pattern and God's promise that every human kingdom eventually becomes Babylon and must be resisted in the power of the slain lamb. But there's a promise that Jesus, who loved and died for this world, will not let Babylon go unchecked. He will return one day to remove evil from his good world and make all things new. And that is a promise that should motivate faithfulness in every generation of God's people until the king returns. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. <laughs> yeah, that's all. All right. That was cool, right? Okay. What's that? Oh, I, I, how did that get there? <laughs> I forgot about that, actually. <laughs> I did that just to see if anyone was paying attention. And you won once again, Mr. Menzel. All right, so let's look at some of this stuff. Let's jump over to chapter 17. And we have the great prostitute and her sexual immorality. And I will read a little bit from uh, 17. 
Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the judgment on the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and had seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls and holding in her hand a golden cup of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. That's definitely not something you want written on your forehead. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast and of the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast is that you saw, was, and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, or the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls to mind with wisdom. This calls, rather, for a mind with wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There's also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one who the other one has not yet come. And when he does come, he will remain only for a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. They are about to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast these are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. And So let's just pause there. And so what do we see so far? We see this mysterious prostitute, this great prostitute, and her sexual immorality. Um, why in the world do you think they have this what, what's the deal with sexual immorality and the great prostitute and, on all of that? Any thoughts on why that would be? Is it, is it actual sexual immorality? Is it other stuff? I've paralyzed you all because you're like, go ahead. I would say it is more that they are going to please our soul yeah. rather than to please God. So they are doing something else. I think that's a really good guess. Even like our world, like sex is king, right? Sex sells. Like every ad is about it. Like you have the whole LGBTQ issue. Like our societies become about it. It is pretty much like, like it or not, like that is the issue, that is the God. right? That is the God. And so, yeah, that's what most guys think. It's really, again, this, the godless worldview. It's the, the kings of the nations of the world who have now drunk this Kool-Aid Right? And are now into this godless worldview. They've set themselves up against the knowledge of God. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The cup of indecencies, right? Um, Satan is peddling sexual immorality and other lust, and the nations are gobbling it up. Right? That, that's basically the scene here. One commentator said, Moral indecency and tyrannical government work together. Gaining the submission of the kings of the earth like the proverbial velvet glove hiding an iron fist. That guy can write, man. I wish I could write like that, right? So it's the same idea. They're just capitalizing on the sin and the lust of the world to promote this anti-God world agenda. Because let's not forget, guys, this is a battle of kingship, right? The kings of the world, the nations of the world, they don't want to hear there's another king. They don't want to hear that there's a king of kings, like they're the kings. That's what the Christians in first century Rome got, in, got killed about, right? It's like, no, there is no other king other than the emperor. And if you keep saying that, you're going to become a lion burger. So stop, right? That's what they did. So another quote, whatever is used by the world to turn believers away from their God is in this cup, the cup she's holding. So pornographic literature, sports in which one becomes completely absorbed, luxuries, worldly fame and power, the lusts of the flesh, and so on. It includes these things that are not bad in themselves as well as things which become bad 
because one does not view them as a means to an end, but an end in themselves. Anybody know a biblical word for something like that? Something that we worship as God, but not really God? Uh, idol. It's idolatry, right? It's idolatry, right? And she's, we see this beast, and this is the same beast from chapter 13. It has seven heads and ten horns, just like the beast from the sea in chapter 13. So we've met this guy before. She's riding this. She's drunk with the blood of the martyrs, just like the nations are drunk on her immorality, right? So a scene of drunkenness and excess and losing their bearings kind of thing, right? There are countless theories on why the heads and the horns, what the numbers are. Uh, back in first century, some guys think it's the seven heads or the seven mountains where Rome was built on. The seven kings could be the seven emperors of Rome, especially if it was written in the 60s, right? But also, we know seven is a symbolic number, right? Which stands for perfection, completeness, all of that. So it's kind of like the perfect forces of evil, so to speak. Ten horns, it's like, why are there more horns than uh, heads? Uh, I like the idea that the reach of Rome is farther than its own kingdom. Right, And so actually the impact of Rome right, goes beyond just Rome. And we see that. We see that that's the pattern. Like it was Babylon and now it's actually Rome. And, and then it was this nation and now it's going to be another nation. And whoever it is, it's just going to keep rolling. So it's really, once again, that it's a fulfillment of a type, of a symbol. In Old Testament times, it was the nation of Babylon. Because the nation of Babylon was the representation of what? pagan idolatry of anti-god right they were the ones that came and and exiled israel and made them worship false gods right so i think the better question then is what is a babylon-like nation or what does a babylon nation look like like it, if it's a type and a symbol which i'm going to say yes what would a nation that we could call Babylon look like? What types of things would be included in a nation? Atheism? Atheism? Yep, absolutely. Idol yep. Idol worship? Yep. What other things? General immorality? Yep, sexual immorality, right? What about, uh, what? Murder. Murder, definitely. Murder babies who stick to it. Getting there. Hold that thought. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> we have, what? I mean, Babylon and Rome were no joke in their military, right? So we have a hugely powerful military, right? What else? Babylon and Rome were very prideful. They were very wealthy. They were very materially wealthy, but they were also primed and ready for a fall, right? Because both of them did fall. So Old Testament times, yes, it was actually Babylon. New Testament times, when this was being written, it's Rome, right? And what is it today? Don't anybody say China. I don't know, because we'll get taken right off YouTube right now. I don't know. But I think it's any of those nations that would act in a Babylon-like way, right? Where you're pushing God out, right? So any kingdom, really, that makes war against God and his church is what we're talking about. Let's look. America. America. <laughs> Hold that thought, Ronald. Let's look at chapter 18. I'll just read the first three verses to give us a little test. Taste, rather. No test. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen, Babylon the great has fallen. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her lux luxurious living. Things coming into focus a little more now of what a Babylon-like nation would look like, right? In Isaiah 21, the prophet foretells the actual fall of Babylon, and he says this same thing. He says, Babylon, Babylon, she has fallen, right? So again, Old Testament readers would know that right away. This is what we're talking about here, a Babylon-like nation. And we talked about, I think, in uh, Advent last week on Sunday, right? When you look at something like Isaiah, you have the near mountains and you have the far mountains, right? So Isaiah was talking about, sure, contextual fulfillment was Babylon itself, 
But what's that mountain off in the distance, right? It's going to be the second coming. It's going to be how the end of the world comes to fruition. It's going to be nations that look like Babylon and whenever the Lord returns, right? Look at verse 2. It says, she has become a dwelling place for demons. And I'm going to read you this quote that both Ron and Ken, I believe, led us to. Imagine a society turning its back on God and outlawing the public influence of his word. Imagine further that the generation afterward, the following trends resulted. Births to unmarried girls increased 500%. Reported child abuse abuse increased 2,300%. The divorce rate rose by 350%. Illegal drug uh, drug use among youths increased by 6,000%. Teenage suicide rose by almost 500%. And in 25% of viable pregnancies, the babies were surgically killed at the mother's request. Would it not be fair to suggest that such a society, having publicly rejected God's rule and experiencing such a complete breakdown of moral order, had become a dwelling place for demons and a haunt for unclean spirits? Would it not further to be fair to suggest, according to our passage, that such a society has actually fallen under the just judgment of God and would soon fall to his wrath unless it repented. And the, the commentator on that was obviously saying, this is, this is us, this is America, this is the world, this is, these are these nations, right? If you, if, you were to, if you were to transport what America looks like into someone's mind who was reading this in 60 AD, I think they would have even been shocked. You know, just what we have going on here. Is it not then just, again, further proof of this symbolic of what a Babylonian nation would look like in rebellion against God? So, yeah, in context, in the Old Testament, Babylon fell. In the New Testament, Rome fell, right? Nations and governments are not not forever. But in verse 4, we have some encouragement for us, specifically as the church. It says, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. What what is that saying? In verse 4, he says, come out of her, my people. Who's my people? Us. What does it mean to come out of her? What does it mean to, in this this way, right? We got Babylon, he says, come out of her. What does that mean? Yeah, supposed to be different, right? Supposed to be set apart. What does that look like? What does that look like to be, he says, no, be set apart. (laughs) Keep praying. I hope it looks like Highlands Bible Church, right? What does that look like? What, What are some ideas of what that looks like? Like we've seen them in society to be separate, to be not part of, right? We've seen sex like maybe the Amish, or monks, or whatever else, or somebody completely different that just rejects society in general. Is that what we're supposed to be doing? Is that what this means? Just reject society and culture? Yeah. Yeah. We have to be in the culture, right, to influence the culture. There's, there's no, there's no, that's that kind of legalism like that independent fundamental baptist kind of thing where it's like don't wear jeans and don't burr, burr. it's like we're, we're in the world like we have to wear clothes and pants and stuff and we can't just you know be totally different right but that doesn't mean that those things in and of themselves are sinful jeremiah gave israel some advice when they were in babylon and i think this is our yeah i think this is really helpful in jeremiah 29 4 through 7 i'll read it right right before the famous Jeremiah 29, 11, right? He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and multiply there. Do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. He's telling Israel, yeah, you're in Babylon. Yeah, they're completely godless. Yes, they're evil. Yes, this is your punishment. But get comfy, right? Get comfy 
pray for the welfare of that city and seek its benefit, right? It, it, it's almost like another iteration of the cultural mandate, right, in Genesis 1. Like, subdue the earth, right? Let the people know that there's a God. We're called to be in this culture, but we're called to be different in this culture, right? And so the idea, again, is how do we influence culture without culture influencing us? And how does the church in and of itself stay pure in the midst of that culture? The answer is not removing ourselves from culture. It is influencing culture in the circles that we are able to, right? All right, brief excursus there. Look at uh, 9 and 10 in chapter 18. The nations mourn the fall of the great city. They're like, oh my gosh, our Babylon is gone. The merchants, which we saw last time, are now mourning their cash cow. They're like, oh my gosh, I made so much money off Babylon or Rome or whatever it is, and now my business is gone because God judged them. I used to run all these porn websites or something, and now they're gone, or I used to run an abortion business, or I used to run this or that, and now they're gone, right? That's what's what they're saying here. But in the last couple of verses of chapter 18, the angel says it very, very clearly. Look at verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea and said, so Babylon, the great city will be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. The imagery, if you ever throw a giant rock into like a pond or something, I mean, that sucker's gone. You're not getting that thing back. It makes a big kathunk sound. It's so awesome. Yeah. Right? Big splash. That's what the angel's illustrating by this. It's like, no, sorry, it's not coming back. It's, it's at the bottom of the sea, and it's gone forever. It's, its end is sure. This is definite. Destruction will be final. We see a scene in chapter 19 of this rejoicing in heaven, right? The contrast. You have people on earth lamenting the fall of this great city, Babylon, and then you have this scene in heaven where they're rejoicing over the fall of Babylon. While the nations mourn, the righteous saints in heaven rejoice. It's just a great contrast. And then he, he goes right into the, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Anybody notice that the Bible begins and ends with a wedding? Right? I was at a wedding one time, and my friend Steve was doing the ceremony, and he, he, had, he started Revelation. <laughs> Everybody laughed. And I made a mental note. I'm like, that's funny. I have to do that at a wedding one time. I have to, wedding sermon from Revelation. Cool. <laughs> Everybody thinks automatically, like, Armageddon, apocalypse, you know, this marriage is doomed. No, but it's like the idea is that the Bible begins and ends with a wedding. It's a covenant, and it's a representation of God's covenant with his Bride. Who is the bride? Ah, oh, darn it. I put it in the slide. <laughs> we are the bride. The church is the bride. And what they're saying in chapter 19 is it's time to fulfill the covenant. The marriage is now complete, right? We are with our, our uh, bridegroom, right? Another way to refer to God. Okay. In the end of chapter 19, we have the, the famous rider on the white horse. Who is the rider on the white horse? Jesus. Everybody's always afraid to say Jesus, right? It's like, it can't be Jesus. It's got to be something way more profound. Nope, it's Jesus. What an image. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but of course we see that he's riding on the white horse. His horse's name is Faithful and True. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His head are many diadems. He's got a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, which the movie was great. It's his own name, right? The name which he has called is the Word of God. What does the Apostle John call Jesus? The Word of God. The Word of God took on flesh and dwelled among us, right? From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, he treads on the winepress the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. We saw that last time. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Does Jesus have a tattoo when he comes back? I think so. It says it's written on his thigh. I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know. This is not Precious Moments Kenny Loggins 80s hair Jesus, is it? This is Jesus tatted up, sword, stained in blood, ready to go to war. 
that's serious. That, I mean, we have to balance our imagery of Jesus with, with this, the warrior Jesus that we see. Right? So we see that, but then we also see immediately he takes the beast, in verse 20, and the false prophet, and they are thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and the birds were gorged with their flesh. It's the defeat of the false prophets. It's the defeat of the, uh, all those uh, enemies that God has, right? This isn't Satan. This is necessarily really Satan's minions and all the evil empires and the propagandas and the people that have set themselves up against God. They are now uh, thrown into the lake of fire forever. So we see Jesus coming as a mighty warrior. Good one to remember. Evil, especially when we feel like evil is getting the upper hand, remember that Jesus will come and he will fight for his bride and he will take back what Satan has taken over to an extent. All right, let's look at chapter 20. All right, so I'm going to read 1 through 15 and then we'll back up and we'll pick this apart, right? Because this is like we're, this is like. If you were trucking along in the all four weeks of this revelation, like to get to this part, like this is your jam. Like you thought this was going to be week one, but ha, it's week four. So <laughs> then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until after the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him forever for a thousand years, or sorry, for a thousand years. And then the thousand years were ended, and Satan was released from his prison, and out of it he came to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, and Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle, Armageddon, right? Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and there they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Hooray! Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what is written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, this is like, we got like three chapters left, right? This is like, we're coming to it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Depends on what view you take. <laughs> and we're going to get into that. Yeah, so hold that thought. And we'll see if, we'll see if we answer that question. Because there's four main views on the millennium. And I'm going to summarize all of them. And, and we'll, we'll see where we end up. So, again, we're, we're focusing on this millennium, right? This is the one passage in the Bible that deals with the millennium. And let me just make one opening salvo that says, should we base our entire philo theology on one passage in the entire Bible? No. No. It's generally not a good idea to do that, right? So this is the only place that this is mentioned in the Bible. The dragon, the ancient serpent, come up from the bottomless pit... That's Satan, who tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, the serpent, Satan. So we see bookends. We see the Bible telling one story, right? 
the ancient serpent. The angel then bounds him for a thousand years. The martyrs are brought back to life. They reign with the Messiah for a thousand years. The rest come to life after the thousand years. Thousand years is the millennium. That's where we get that word from. That means 1,000 years, right? And so the main point, again, Jesus wins, right? There are four views on the millennium, okay? And I'm going to truck through them, and hopefully that will answer all of your questions that are swirling around in your head. Maybe not. The first one is pre-millennialism, and that is what we'd say historic or classic. Now, if you're thinking uh, Left Behind series, if you're thinking Secret Rapture, like, that's not this, okay? This is classic, historic pre-millennialism, right? And so when was that popular? That was right, really, the early church. The early church believed that right from the get-go, and probably up until about the fourth century. Did they believe in a literal future millennium? Yes, they did. They thought that that was a thousand years that was going to happen in the future. And as far as an event timeline, they believed that there would be the tribulation that would come, the return of Christ would come after the tribulation, right? And then Satan would be bound, believers would be resurrected, then you'd have the millennium, ergo, why it's called pre-millennial, right? Because Christ comes before the millennium. During the millennium, peace returns. There's no sin and evil because Satan and all his minions are sucking up the bottom of the, the pit of despair there in the lake of fire, right? There comes the judgment where unbelievers are resurrected, where they will be judged, and then you have the eternal state, which is the new kingdom, new heaven and earth. So that would be a rough event timeline of what we call classic premillennialism. And early church dudes like Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, other guys, they were the ones that were like, yeah, this is, this is, you know, first century guys, second century guys, like they would say this is. So this enjoyed a brief kind of uh, uh, prominence, I guess you'd say, in the early, early church. That gave way to what is called amillennialism. Anybody know what Ah, uh, why would they call it ah uh, millennialism? <laughs> there, there is no millennium, which is true. I mean, that's literally what it means, no millennium, right? But that's not, they believe in a millennium, it's just in a different form, right? And, and we'll see that in a minute. So this was, the prominence of this was the early church really took over from around the 5th century, watch this, to the 15th century. So it's funny that we're talking about a millennium thousand years, because this was kind of like, the reign, like there was, this was the undisputed champion of eschatology for a thousand years in the church, right? Do they believe in a literal future millennium? No, they did not. And here's where the ah part comes in of the ah millennium. They say, we're living in the millennium. The millennium is the church age. The millennium is when Jesus ascended back after his resurrection, that started the millennium. Because guess what? The millennium is symbolic. It's not literally a thousand years, just like there's not literally 144,000 piece of people, you know, or literally seven heads and ten horns and all that stuff. So they would interpret the thousand years to be symbolic. And they say that would represent the entire church period from Jesus ascending until the time Jesus comes back. It's a very, very simplistic view. It's kind of refreshingly simple. It's the as far as events, it would be the return of Christ. Everybody would be resurrected at the same time. Satan would be defeated. There would be a judgment. And voila, we would spend eternity with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth. So it's a very, very simple thing. These were, you know, some no-name guys that believe this, like Augustine, Luther, Calvin. Like nobody really important believed that, that reigned. So this is uh, ah millennialism, all right? And I'll just work my way through this, and then we can back up with any questions, all right? Yeah, overwhelmingly, you're going to look at Revelation in a symbolic imagery fashion, right? It's rooted in Old Testament, for sure, but rooted in the symbolism, not the literal interpretation of it, right? Yep. Then we come into prominence with post-millennialism. 
Anybody know what a post-millennial? So we had pre-millennial, right? Christ came back before the millennium. Post-millennium, that means Christ would come back after the millennium, right? So this was kind of concurrent with amillennialism. It was, it was not as dominant. Now it is traditionally, most people would say, the dominant reformed view. So if you come from like a Presbyterian background or something like that, uh, it, most of them are going to side with post-millennium. Is it a literal future millennium? No, not typically, although there are guys that would say that, yes, it probably is. But most of them, I would probably say, they don't say it's a literal thousand years in the future. And as far as events, right, and I put these things in quotes, like a tribulation, right, in the sense like most of that tribulation has already happened. That's the partial preterist view. Most of the tribulations already happened, and they would point to passages like Matthew 24 and the fall of Rome. Or, yeah, the fall of, sorry, Jerusalem by Rome in 70 A.D. There's not, uh, Jesus hasn't returned yet, obviously, but they would say most of the tribulation has happened or is happening, right? The millennium is mostly the current age, but the really distinguishing characteristic about a post-mill perspective is that things gradually actually improve. And we experience this kind of golden age, where throngs of people are being saved, where the gospel's going out to new places that it's never gone out before, things gradually improve. There's the golden age of the kingdom and the church. The gospel's preached, as Matthew 24, 14, that'd be one of their flagship verses, it says, the gospel's preached to all nations, and then the end will come, right? Um, return of Christ would happen, general uh, resurrection, Satan's defeated, judgment, eternal state, Right? Um, people who believe that or promoted that would be a lot of Puritans and another guy that we don't know very well named Jonathan Edwards. No, He's an amazing man of God. And last but certainly not least, just in case your heads didn't hurt quite enough, we have dispensational premillennials. Now watch this. Remember all these other ones that had lots and lots of history? Dispensational premillennialism is only from the 19th century on. So we're dealing with about 100 years or so that we've been looking at this. But today, it is the dominant or it is really kind of assumed in evangelical or non-denom people like us, right? And I say assumed because a lot of us non-denominational people don't do work in Revelation, right? So maybe they read a book on uh, Left Behind or or saw some crazy video on YouTube, and they're like, yeah, that's probably what's going to happen, right? For whatever reason evangelicalism is fascinated with dispensational premillennialism, and it doesn't take more than five seconds on YouTube to figure that out, right? Especially with things going on in Israel, and we've got COVID, and we've got this and that, and all these things are signs, and we figure it out, and it comes to, this is it, right? Is it a literal future millennium? You bet your bottom dollar. They are like not moving on that one inch. It is a literal thousand years that Christ will come to earth And if you're confused, if you're not confused, you're going to be confused now because this is complicated. The first thing and the identifying factor of dispensational dispensational premillennialism is something called the secret rapture of the church. Suddenly, boom, Christ descends like a thief in the night and everybody who is in Christ is gone and only their clothing remains there and they are now in heaven You know, I saw a scary movie one time where, like, there were Christian pilots and, like, people were dying and stuff because they got raptured and, you know, all of that stuff. Christ returns. You're going to see several returns, several judgments, and several resurrections. It makes my head hurt. Christ returns with the secret rapture of the church for the first time. There's a a first judgment where believers then were swept up with Christ and were judged for our, 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 uh, what we've done in Christ and we're rewarded with him. And the believers, of course, before they have to do that, if they're dead, they're resurrected. Then comes this period of tribulation. But who cares? Because we're not here, right? <laughs> we're up in heaven. The second resurrection, uh, resurrection happens, which is any believers or elect Jews who died in the tribulation. After that, Christ returns a second time or a third time, depending on how you're counting. Satan is defeated. We then have this wonderful millennium, right? 
And this is where Israel, this is another distinguishing aspect of this, is that Israel is completely Israel again. Israel and the church, remember we said that a couple times ago? They're completely separate, right? Israel, you have Israel, so yes, make Jerusalem great again, like it happens, like the, t- the temple literally comes down, it squashes the dome on the rock or whatever else is there, it's there, it's Ezekiel's literal temple, sacrifices start again, everything starts again, this is the millennium, this is the restored Israel, the restored temple. Judgment then happens, which I think is the second judgment for the unbelievers, or the third judgment, depending on how you're counting, the unbelievers are resurrected and then punished, and then we have our eternal state, right? People, yes, the people uh, that were famous for this were John Darby, Dwight Moody, and a guy named Schofield who wrote a reference Bible. Anybody ever have a Schofield reference Bible? Yeah, <laughs> right? That's all about this, right? That's where that came from. That was literally one of the things that set this thing on fire, was the success of that study Bible. And people were like, oh my gosh, right? Okay, go ahead. So is the rapture and then us actually there in Revelation an example of the continuous secret rapture of the church that... From one passage. Right. First Thessalonians, I think it's First Thessalonians 4. I don't have the exact reference, um, but it is, it is that verse where Christ will come, the church will be swept up, to meet him in the air. Right? I think it's... Second Thessalonians 4 or First Thessalonians 4. I should have looked it up. Sorry, guys. Oh, coming of the Lord, right? Um, 416. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and dead in Christ will rise first. Then we are alive who are left. will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. It's ripped completely out of context, really. And this is where I'm going to reveal my hand again, because if you didn't know that again, I, I can't make any sense of dispensational premillennialism. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't, this is one verse, this is out of context. It, I think one of the most dangerous things about dispensational premillennialism is that it makes the rapture our hope. Our hope is getting out of here. And I did, we, we, we've been through Revelation. We don't see that. We see, we see countless passages in Scripture that says you have to endure until the end to be saved and, and that and things are coming and that persecution's coming and all of that. It doesn't say you're going to be saved from all those things. So again, they have one verse in here that they take out of context and they're going to build their whole theology around one passage. I don't think that's a good way to do biblical theology. And it's... it's, it's first... Verse 416, yeah. And again, I want to be clear. Like, if, if you hold to a dispensational premillennialism, I, I'm not mad at you. I just, and these things are, are secondary issues at the end of the day, right? What we have to keep on the top is Jesus returns. The exact emphasis of how he returns, we can have different views on, right? Right? So, I, I, if you're going to ask me where I'm going to lean, which you are, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to lean away from dispensational premillennialism because biblically it just doesn't hold up to me. And, and the idea of us being saved before things get really bad here on earth, is it, sure, who wouldn't want that? And, and so it's just one verse that they're building that on. Yeah. What about Matthew 24, 40? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it is something that. Yeah, definitely. It, you're right. It is something. It is. It is one that people do use to support the rapture. I think this is, Matthew 24 is one of those passages where it's like, where's the line in what has happened already and what has not happened already, right? Um, I, I still would say that I don't think that's going to prove that that's before the tribulation. I think that's the key, is, is 
Sure, like the rapture is, yeah, the rapture you could say is a biblical concept. Like we are going to be with Christ, right? The issue is when. Right. Yeah, so like I would agree. Like we're going to be raptured to be with Christ. We're going to be taken to be with Christ. But I don't think that's going to mean before a, a tribulation, right, that we're spared this hardship. Because that's, that's a real, real problem because you really get consumed. And I, I joke around about YouTube all the time, but you get consumed with it. You know, you get consumed with all these things that are like, what are the signs? What are the symbols? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the focus slowly but surely gets off Christ. Yeah. You know, <laughs> everything's going to pan out. Yeah, definitely. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. It's another good point. Yeah. Until I think I really got saved and then realized that like all of this, like to me, it was so secondary if you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus to have that kind of change. Yeah. So how it's gonna happen when it's like going through the tribulation, but I feel like we're going through tribulation right now. You know, my sure. son is in a lot of ways. It's like that quote I read a couple of weeks ago, like, it'd be really hard to tell a Christian in North Korea or Syria or Iran that they're not in the Great Tribulation right now. You know, yeah. and it's, so it's, where is the limit? How do we trust? How yeah. do we trust and endure until the end with whatever we may have to lose? Yeah. And fixing our eyes on the hope. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and that hope being Christ, I, right? You know, I had the worst day of my life last year, you know? Yeah, so this view does... It's, it's a mystery, and it kind of does generate, could generate some fear. The other thing is, let's not forget, Paul cautioned Timothy and a couple other elders to not be consumed with myths and endless genealogies, right? I would say this fall, if you're going to read Revelation, you're going to try to milk everything. If you're going to do the, the, the Fox News eschatology, you know, every single thing in here means something, and you're, you're chasing myths. You're chasing endless genealogies. And why? Why was Paul's beef about that? He's like, guys, you're missing the point. Like, it's about the gospel. It's about Jesus. And you're here spinning your wheels about all these genealogies and numbers and things. And, and it's about Jesus winning. About, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. It gets very divisive. Yeah. 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 Angela, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah. That what was afterwards? Yeah. The tribulation was after. Yeah. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had another. Yeah. Yeah, so it's... I, I think it's a risky position to take because I think it'll it'll lead you down a rabbit trail that could distract you from the main thing, right? and that's I think that's that's one of the biggest dangers, right? So obviously I don't lean that way. I I, I lean definitely Amil. I lean definitely like I feel like it's just a way more biblical, simple. Like this is the entire church age of what we've been watching throughout the history of the church. And it's just a, uh, there's so much symbolism in here. There's so much tie back to the Old Testament. So I definitely lean Amil, but, you know, like I got to hold it open-handed. I don't know. I'm very sympathetic to post-mill, although it's hard for me to kind of sympathize and say, yes, we're going to have this golden period where lots of people are going to get saved. And an Amil, uh, a post-mill guy would say, well, yes, 
but look at what's happening. Like, we have, YouTube could be used for crazy people, but YouTube could be used for preaching the gospel, and it has been. Like, YouTube and the internet is broadcasting the gospel to places that people would never dream of right now, and people are getting saved. We've got crazy things going on in the South American church. We've got the church in China, the underground church. Like, it's like there are really amazing things that actually are happening. So I'm kind of sympathetic to that because that position would say, yeah, well, don't just go by the news. Go by these incredible advances. Like talk to somebody from Wycliffe, right, that people, languages are getting translated, biblical, uh, the Bible is getting translated into languages that it never has been before. So there are really good things happening in the midst of, Tribulation, right? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. Right. So, bottom line, guys, you know, we've got to hold a lot of this open handed, um, but we've got to know what Revelation says. We can't be afraid of it. And we've got to not be overly fascinated with it either. And you got to watch that it's not leading us down a trail that is going to, again, again, one of the biggest dangers is like our hope is what? That we're out of here? Or that our hope is Christ himself in the midst of it? Well, oh, I thought of what I was going to say, and then we're going to move on and finish, I promise. Um, 1 Corinthians 15 gives a really good order. You can read it later. It says when Christ returns, you know, the last enemy to be defeated is death. Right? And so if Christ is going to come and there's going to be a resurrection at that time, then that's not the last enemy. That's the first enemy. Right? So just look at that, look at that progression in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Because if, if it really is like Christ returns before the millennium and that we're saved before you know, that happens and, and believers are resurrected to be with Christ in this whatever millennium happiness thing, right? And then Christ comes back and defeats death. It's like, well, no, you're out of order, according to 1 Corinthians 15. So just a simple passage to kind of, that I go to that kind of cuts through a lot of it. It's very simple when Paul just says, Christ will come and the last enemy to be defeated will be death. Not the first one. So, okay, let's look at the last two chapters really quick. These will go quickly. Um, We have the new heavens and the new earth beautiful picture of what awaits us, new heaven and a new earth. The old earth had passed away, right? The sea was no more, which is kind of interesting. The sea, which sea? The sea, all of the seas, right? Um, The sea represented biblically chaos. Remember darkness and stuff? We talked about that last time. Yeah. And so the reality is there's no more chaos. There's no more death. There's no more drowning. There's no more turmoil. There's no more all of that 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 represented. God dwells with man because there's no sin. There's no evil. There's no Satan. The city is holy and it's pure and it's called Jerusalem. Again, is it a literal Jerusalem? I don't, I don't lean that way, right? If you want to hold to that view, I'm not going to be mad at you. But like clearly we were talking about a literal Babylon, So it's what Babylon represented. It's what Jerusalem represented. Jerusalem represents what? The city of God, where God's presence dwells, where God's people are. That's the point of the passage, not, you know, getting stuck on the literalness of Jerusalem. There's no temple, which I thought was really interesting, and because God's there. Jesus, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, right? It's, it's, now he's doing it perfectly on earth in the new kingdom. There's no more death. There's no more tears. There's no more pain. I read that on Sunday, that wonderful passage. And then he goes on to measure the city, which again, you can get all tripped up on, right? I, I love to side with the guys who just cut through. It's like, look, like again, more symbolic, like 12,000. You have the number 12. If you, want to, if you want to read something into it, how about this? 12 tribes of Israel and 12 New Testament apostles. That makes a lot of sense. I, I'm not sure. It's, and, and nobody else is either. It's the measurements of perfection, I think. It's the measurements of just the vastness of God's kingdom. Personally, I do think it's a shout out to 
tying the Old Testament and the New Testament together with the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles together. That'll have some question marks after that. You know, not really sure. And then, of course, chapter 22, the river of life. River of life sets my feet a-dancing. That was for you, Ron. <laughs> we see the river of life in something like the book of Genesis. So we're dealing with a return to the Garden of Eden. Once again, more throwbacks to the beginning and the end of Scripture. There's no lamp and there's no sun. Why is there no lamp and no sun? Yeah, because we have the true light of the world, right? And I just want to read uh, 6 through 21. I know I've skimmed a lot, but this is the we got to read the end of this. I mean, come on, we've been through so much together, right? 22, verse 6, And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits and of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Jesus speaking, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, get up, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and the prophets and with those who keep the words of the book. Worship God, he says. In case you're ever wondering, we don't worship angels and this is a really good reason why. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Jesus speaking, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay anyone for what he's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David. Hey, we just talked about that on Sunday. The bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. Isaiah 55. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So great, great ending. Gives you goosebumps just reading the end of that. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful picture. And I love how Jesus cuts in the middle of this with his reassurances of, of who he is, you know. So some takeaways. Remember, Revelation is not a puzzle book. It's a picture book. Resist the Fox News CNN eschatology. And I really liked what the video said, that every human kingdom eventually becomes Babylon. Why? Because their lust for power, their lust for sin, their lust for everything. They're going to continue to do that. Yep, yep. God's word is trustworthy, even when we can't figure out every single detail. We saw that in this, just even in this last one, the, the reverence that he has, like write these words down, cherish these words. Jesus is worthy of worship, not anything else, not even his messengers, just Jesus. Right? He's also the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's worthy of worship. But for us, we should be ready for the return of Jesus. And we should be doing that by staying faithful even under persecution. So we've got to be thinking of these things. It's a little bit easier to think for us to think about persecution, right, a little bit, because we start to see that Christianity has fallen out of favor, right, that we are being marginalized now, that the church is being marginalized, that the government's overreaching in a lot of areas. We're starting to see these things, so it's a little bit easier to picture that, right? 
We have to be ready for the return of Jesus. In order to be ready for the return of Jesus, we have to be faithful. That's a great prayer. When you're, when you're wondering how to pray for yourself, pray that you will be found faithful. That you'll be found faithful on the last day. We are to revere God's word, and he cautions, do not add to it, and he threatens consequences. Do not take away from it. And all the Bible tells one story again. There's so many things in this last, last chapter, throwbacks to the Garden of Eden and, and hints from Isaiah and all of that that just kind of rings true about the Bible telling one story from beginning to end. And of course, Jesus wins. Another good takeaway for us. Amen. Maranatha, as the uh, says, come Lord Jesus. It makes us cry out for that too when we see things that are hard for us to watch or hard for us to see and the effects of sin and tragedy or natural disaster, like our heart kind of cries out for that, like enough, like just come Lord Jesus. Yep, yep, so... It is, it is good and proper to pray for that as well, to pray, although we don't want to, you know, w- we can't affect it in any, any way that, any sooner that God has decreed it, but it's God's will that Jesus returns, and so we should be praying for that and be praying that we're found faithful on that day as well, and that all the people that are his will be gathered into his family before that time. Other parting thoughts? All this time we spent together cruising through Revelation at lightning speed. Are you encouraged? Confused? (laughs) A mix of encouragement and confusion? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, by, by seeing that over and over and over again, right? The seven seals and the seven, uh, seven trumpets and the seven bowls, right? All of that. The Old Testament plagues. And yeah, very good. Well, let me pray for us. Father, we do thank you for your word. It is... Uh, we look at it and, and, and we're, we're so kind of preconditioned to try and figure out what all these things mean. Let us just take a, a, and consider its beauty and its depth to think about your throne and all the, the jewels that were around the throne and the way it's described and, and think about the beauty of the new heavens and the new earth and think about the power of Christ as he returns, Jesus the warrior. Think about how he will not let the martyrs uh, be hopeless. That their blood cries out and he will redeem them and resurrect them and, and they will spend eternity together with us around the throne as we praise the Lamb, the only one who is worthy to take the seals off of the scroll. And Lord, we do pray for your return, but even with that, we, we pray with trepidation because, Lord, we want the work of the church to be fruitful. We want people to come to an understanding of the gospel. And so we pray for that, but we pray for our our own faithfulness. We pray that we are found faithful on that day that you return, trusting in you, looking forward to your return, Lord. Let us not be discouraged with how we see society and culture. Lord, there are many people that are going through hard times right now. We pray that you would encourage them with the hope of your return and the hope of your authority and your kingdom, and that one day we will be with you forever in a perfect kingdom. And we thank you for that. Encourage our hearts to be steadfast until then. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen.